does God exist? The ancient arguments rage. Throughout history, religion has dominated human culture. And even today, to the surprise of some of the age of science, God remains central. struggled with God, lurching and lapsing from one side to another, sometimes by design, often by default. But how can I believe in God if I do not understand God? Nothing else engenders such commitment, disputation, zealotry. Such passion makes sense. Because if there's a God, nothing can be more important. But does God make sense? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and this is my journey to find out. My search begins with Richard Swinburne, one of the foremost Christian philosophers. Emeritus professor at Oxford, Richard is lecturing in the U.S. and can meet me in Washington. It's a Sunday, and before our talks, he'll attend an Orthodox church. I've never been, and ask if I might tag along. I'm a bit queasy. It's my first close encounter. Richard, the typical response to a theist position is, okay, God created the universe, but who created God? Uh, the answer is, of course, given the traditional view of God, no one created God. Uh, if God has the traditional properties, uh, those include God being omnipotent, that is, able to do everything. Now, uh, if there was something which created God, then something would have happened which God was not responsible for. But if being is omnipotent, then everything that happens, either he allows it to happen or he brings it about. But if something created him, then something would have happened which he didn't uh, allow or bring about. So clearly, if there is a God, that's the end of the explanatory ladder. If there is a God, then the that explains everything. Nothing created God. That is the final terminus of the explanation of the universe and everything we are familiar with. I am taken by Richard's austere analysis. Actually, I'm a little intimidated. God as the end of the explanatory ladder? God as final terminus? But isn't the term God being defined as final terminus? Is this reasoning circular? I need to dig into the attributes of God, describing the kind of God to which Richard's arguments lead. I follow him back to Oxford. Graciously, he invites me to Hightown, a grand Oxford tradition. Richard, I have had a lifelong deep desire to understand what God is, and I come to you to understand, as you put it so eloquently, the person picked out by this name, God. Yes, what I'm going to describe to you is the traditional view uh, about Christianity, Judaism, Islam, of what God is like. It's also the kind of God to which my arguments lead. Um, God is clearly supposed to be a personal being in the sense of someone with whom we interact. And a person is someone with powers. I'm a person because I can do certain things. 
God can do certain things, but his powers are infinite, so he's omnipotent, he can do anything. Part of me being a person is that I've got certain beliefs about the world. Uh, God has beliefs about the world, but he has all true beliefs, so he knows everything, he is omniscient. Uh, I can make choices between alternatives, that's part of what makes me a person, so in that sense I have a certain amount of freedom. Uh, but of course I'm influenced by irrational desires of various kinds, so my freedom is limited. He has perfect freedom, he is not influenced by irrational desires or anything outside himself. So he is a personal being who is omnipotent, omniscient and perfectly free. Anything lasts for a certain amount of time, I last for a certain amount of time. God uh, lasts for an infinite amount of time and I prefer to construe that as saying he's everlasting, he exists at all moments of past time, exists now and will exist at all moments of future time. From these characteristics of God, omnipotence, omniscience and perfect freedom and eternity, there follow all the other traditional attributes of God. To Richard, God's attributes line up in logical progression. From a person, to powers, to all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly free, everlasting, and the creator of the universe. Richard claims that his arguments about God drive relentlessly, inexorably, to the existence of God. But why the heavy toil? If God really exists, why should his existence be so difficult to demonstrate? I hear Alvin Plantinga has a different view. Not worrying how to prove God, Al is one of the world's leading philosophers of religion, credited for revitalizing Christian philosophy. At Notre Dame, we meet in the Reformed church he attends. Alvin, all my life I've been listening to arguments about God. I want to know whether God exists. I'm trained in science, so I hear the scientific arguments, the philosophical arguments, the theological arguments. You've told me in your writings that I don't need arguments. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we start from certain ideas, certain beliefs, certain thoughts. Why shouldn't the existence of God be among those? Well, most people who believe in God don't believe on the basis of these arguments. There are some good arguments, but people don't. Most people don't even know about these arguments. And the question is, why do you have to have an argument? I mean, who says this? Where, where does this come from, this demand that you have an argument here or else you're out of line? It's in our nature to believe that there are other minds. This is, you might say, hardwired into us by God or evolution or both. The same for the past. And I'm suggesting the same goes for, uh, for the existence of God. It seems to me that um, if it's true that there is such a person as God, then very likely, I would say, almost certainly, our belief in God is warranted. I think you can be perfectly sensible, uh, rational, reasonable, justified, intellectually okay, meeting your responsibilities, etc., believing in God without believing on the basis of arguments, even if you don't think there are any good arguments. I think that's how actually most people do believe in God, and I think that's a perfectly proper way. Al calls belief in God properly basic. God is bedrock belief, not needing verification. One need not prove God from other things, but rather other things from God. If God exists, then God would have built into our brains a natural capacity and a native proclivity to believe in God. That's why formal arguments, Al says, do not much matter. That won't work for Daniel Dennett. He's a leading philosopher who does not believe in God and not shy about trumpeting his unbelief. We meet in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 
at his suggestion, in a church. Dan, I would really like to know whether God exists, and I've been asking a lot of smart people questions. And most of the people who don't believe in God would seek to attack and, sh and undermine the arguments of those who do. Fine. I'd like to flip that around mm -hmm. and say, what are the affirmative arguments for non-belief or for atheism? Well, I think the first one is simply has to be uh, this is the way naturalism always argues. I mean, the burden of proof is, is, is sort of on the other side. Uh, uh, don't multiply entities beyond necessity. So uh, the main reason for atheism is what for? What do we, what do we, need, what do we need God for? Especially since we've got a, a surfeit of reasons for seeing why in the absence of a God, we would nevertheless believe in God. I mean, there's plenty of natural arguments to explain why this false belief would arise. So we don't have the puzzle of, gosh, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, where there's so much belief that God must exist. No, I think we can just set that aside. So now as, the question- As neutral. As neutral, yeah. So that, that, that cuts no real ice here. So now the question is, uh, if there's no positive argument for the existence of God, then we should just assume there isn't one for the same reason we should assume that there isn't um, a gog. Um, what's gog? Well, it's a, a sphere of copper two miles in diameter with the word gog stamped on it. Um, and it's outside the light cone. So we can never see it. <laughs> we have no reason to posit its, its existence. So we might just as well assume it doesn't exist. So the, the core yeah, concept yeah. is that the burden is on the other side. Sure. If you understand that God is supposed to be good mm -hmm. and supposed to be all powerful, then the problem of evil really looms. Why would a good God allow such, such, such horrible things to go on? I think that evil is, you can't explain it away. And it doesn't have, a, as it were, a dramatic purpose. Well, it are. exists because it can. We have to remember that the idea that God is good is a f fairly recent domestication of religion. There were plenty of bad gods mm -hmm. uh, in the early days, and this is a, a recent refinement. And of course, the problem of evil just disappears if you go back to the old religions, because we have good gods and bad gods, <laughs> and they're duking it out. And there's something very satisfying about that. And once you decide to get rid of the bad gods, <laughs> and, and be a monotheistic and suppose that God is good, then you have this nasty problem of explaining yeah. uh, uh, why then all this evil you're happens. Not argue, you're not arguing to go back to the old ways, are you? <laughs> there was a certain uh, dramatic integrity to them that is missing from the more recent ideas of God. When the, the people that, that created the comic book character Superman, uh, they realized they had a problem. They had this omnipotent, indestructible uh, agent. And where can they, how can there be suspense? How can there be any storylines? They had to invent kryptonite so that there would be a countervailing force in the world. And I view theologians' attempts to handle the problem of evil as this is, this is just kryptonite. <laughs> but what does that have to do with what's true? It's just how to tell a story. Wishful wondering can corrode concrete discernment. Maybe doubt can be liberated. Maybe all my God talk is too Western. I find that one of the world's great Islamic philosophers, Sayyid Hossein Nasser, teaches at George Washington University. Hossein, in trying to understand the meaning of God, I've been speaking to different theologians, but most of them are from the Christian perspectives. And I come to you to learn about the Islamic view of God. In the ordinary language of, Islamic, of the Islamic religion, when you say Allah, it means both the one personal God whom we worship and to whom we pray, like Christians and Jews do, but also that metapersonal, I will not say impersonal, the metapersonal infinite reality 
absolute reality which is even above being. So it's not just supreme being, it's non-being beyond that and beyond being, which is a That's wonderful right. term. Exactly. It's the beyond being. How, how, how do we interact with that, or maybe we don't, and that's the point. The word act would not apply here, nor would the word interact, because interact already implies a duality. We have inter, hmm. one thing acts and the other acts. Right. At that level, you have transcended the domain of duality. One of the grandeurs of the Islamic revelation is a revelation of 99 names revealed in the Quran, in which God reveals himself as those names. For example, God is the infinitely merciful. So when we think of God, we think of infinite mercy. God is the all good. God is beauty, the supreme beauty. So all beauty ref reflects his beauty. God is all power and so forth and so on. Also names which appear negative to us. For example, not only is God the giver of life, but he's also the taker of life, giver of death. And not only is he merciful, but he's also a judge. So the divine names are ways in which, first of all, mentally, we grasp certain qualities associated with God. But much more than that, they are like ropes thrown to us, which we cling to and which lead us to God. Islam's God is so ineffably transcendent beyond the being, yet revealed through the 99 divine names, some of which, well, are quite earthy. Maybe my search for God is too Abrahamic. After all, Islam and Christianity, as well as Judaism, claim Abraham as their founding father. I'll ask Vivi Raman, a physicist from the Hindu tradition. Vivi, I am almost believing in God. And in that process, what's really important to me is to understand what that God would be like. In the Hindu worldview, God is not an entity whose existence is to be believed in, but rather it is an experience. Whether one experiences God or not is what matters in the Hindu worldview, not whether one believes in it. God, from the Hindu perspective, is somewhat like music. Music is not accessible to everybody. If one is born stone deaf, one cannot appreciate music. One may appreciate many other things. There are other faculties. I'm not belittling. But as an analogy, I'm saying that just as people who can hear know what is music, people who are sensitive to the divine can know what is divine. If I ask you how many music are there, the question is really irrelevant. I mean, it's meaningless almost. You know that there are countless songs and cons concertos and symphonies and ditties and whatnot. Likewise, the divine can be experienced in innumerable ways. So, uh, is Hinduism monotheistic? It's certainly in the sense of there being one ultimate truth. It's polytheistic, certainly in the sense of that truth being expressed in different ways. Can discordant religions be harmonized? If anyone can do it, that person is Houston Smith, a lifelong Christian who practiced Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sufism each for 10 years. Houston is almost 90 and about deaf, and still the giant of religious studies. Can he help me make sense of God? You know, in the last century, why H.G. Wells, he was asked, does God make sense? 
He groaned and said, <laughs> What else? <laughs> I think that's right on the mark. Hmm. With God in place, all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fit together and we have a panoramic view which is beautiful and awesome. Scientists would argue that the new science of physics and cosmology have a, 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 an increasingly powerful picture of how the world was created. And that if you add a supernatural factor, it brings problems because how does a supernatural a power interact with the physical world? Well, I just have to give vent to my feelings and say, to hell with them. <laughs> or uh, more moderately, what do they know? <laughs> they are absolutely brilliant in their own field. Uh -huh. But when they get out of it, they don't know what is going on. Science has to deal with what comes to us through our senses, mostly sight. But it's an incomplete world. Nobody has ever seen a thought. Nobody has ever seen a feeling. Plato has a saying of uh, truth is beyond word. It has to be transmitted uh, like light from a leaping flame. Houston is captivating. I'd love to join his journey but I balk at his claim that all major religions are true. I need a dose of skepticism. And to get a syringe full, I visit Michael Shermer, the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. We meet on Mount Wilson, high above Los Angeles, a cathedral of science, where Edwin Hubble discovered the universe to be expanding and immense. Michael, you've told me you're a weak atheist. You don't look weak to me. <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, you know, the label, the label game, uh, you know, atheist, agnostic, uh, secular humanist, humanist, bright, whatever. Uh, I don't like the labels at all. Uh, I just don't believe in God. I would be shocked and amazed if it turned out there was a God. Uh, you can call me whatever you want. Uh, traditionally, a strong atheist is someone says, you know, I believe there is no God, the weak atheist, I have no belief in God. I slightly prefer the, the latter, that uh, I just don't believe So you leave a little a room, no, just not really, in case. Not really. I'm, just in case, just in case you'd be... Uh, well, that's right. I mean, if, I, if you're going to take a scientific perspective, yeah, I can't prove there is no God. But the fact that I can't prove there is no God doesn't mean I'm like sort of waiting for more evidence. Um, you know, sort of on the fence, mm -hmm. uh, oh, let's see, oh, that's a good argument, maybe I'll reconsider, you know, I mean, I would be shocked at this point if, if it turned out there was. When you have your doubts, everybody has some kind of doubts, sure. mm -hmm. where would that find itself? Oh, probably uh, in some of these ultimate questions about space and time and the, you know, the meaning of the universe. Sometimes, it, it, usually I'm perfectly comfortable with my position. Every once in a while I feel a little bit of existential angst over what it all means, uh, but not usually. So I guess it's in those moments. So does God make sense? To me, honestly, nothing makes sense. God, no God, both hit circularities, endless regressions, dead ends. Arguments? I love them all. But they all falter. Perhaps I've progressed. I now see a richer, more textured picture of what a supreme being might be like. Many people seem certain of their beliefs. 
I wish I were certain. I may continue lurching and lapsing in my beliefs, but I will never cease wondering, striving, searching. My search is what this entire series is all about, an exploration of cosmos, consciousness, and God. As for me, for now, passionate uncertainty is closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.